So, Doctor, it's strep, right? Which makes you think, hmm. Well, she does have a sore throat and not much cough, but I just don't see any exudate. Then again, it's only been about four or five hours. Hmm, what were those criteria again? Should I just swab? Man, those parents really want antibiotics, but the child appears so well. I bet there's a playbook on this. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. To test or not to test. To treat or not to treat. Where do we start when everyone is worried about strep throat? There's a lot to consider here. The uncertainty in diagnosis, fake outs in epidemiology, what we can try to prevent and what we just can't prevent. Mix this all up, add in some worried family members, dump it all into the timed pressure cooker of the emergency department, and it's tempting to just give them what they want. The struggle is real, and no one should preach when your waiting room is bustling and you have more serious presentations to attend to. But then again, there's that whole do-no-harm thing that we do our best to live by. So, let's go through a case, step by step, and use this opportunity to talk about the rationale behind each decision. A bit of a strep-inspired Choose your own adventure. Once upon a time, there was a girl named Jenny. She's eight. Jenny came home after school one day with an itchy throat. It was a busy weekday, and when they got home, her mother asked her for some help to clean up before dinner. The more her mother asked, the deeper Jenny nestled into her comfy couch. She didn't end up eating much dinner. When Jenny complained again about her sore throat afterwards, that was it. We're going to see the doctor, her mother announced. Jenny slothed behind her mother into triage, into the room to see you. Jenny appears well behind her grumpiness. She does have erythema to her oropharynx and tonsillar pillars. No exudate. Maybe some shoddy anterior lymphadenopathy. Before you can finish your exam, her mother interjects, She's had strep throat five times this year. So, are you going to give her antibiotics? I don't want my other kids getting sick too. If you smile and continue with your history and physical exam, turn to page 10. If you readily agree with the mother and move on, turn to page 304. Page 10. Jenny's mother is anxious. As you talk more with Jenny, her mother adds, Tell him about how you wouldn't eat your dinner. And tell him how tired you were and you couldn't help out around the house. You want to just cut to the chase, but you realize a few extra minutes of your time to elicit history from the girl herself to validate her mother's concerns and to ask all of the pertinent questions that is what will save time and energy in the end. So can you please just test her, doctor? Says her mother, insisting more than asking. Both ladies stare at you anxiously. If you call it a day and grab the swabs, turn to page 1026. If you make your decision based on what you see now, turn to page 11. Page 11. You think back to what the midwife told you on your OB rotation. When the sun rises in the west, sets in the east, when the seas go dry and mountains blow in the wind like leaves, when your waiting room empties again and you can finish your sandwich on shift. 
That is when you can please all people, not before. So as you can see, every interaction, every piece of new information, every expectation and external pressure can shape the way the story unfolds. Let's talk a little bit about what we're up against. Group A Streptococcus biogenes lives only on the skin and mucous membranes in humans. We get it through droplet secretions, really from close quarters. So families, military, roommates... Many, many people are asymptomatic carriers of the bacterium. Of those, only a minority will develop an infection. Now, it's nothing to be cavalier about. The superlative complications of strep throat are nasty. Peritonsillar abscess is no fun. More common in the 5- to 15-year-old group, they just don't appreciate the treatment that you'll have to do for the peritonsillar abscess. Sinusitis can happen too. The bugs travel from the oral pharynx into the osteomedial complex and into the sinuses. Which also leads us to another complication, otitis media. And we're talking real otitis media. To, up to 10% of otitis media in the winter can be due to streptococcus. Skin and soft tissue infections can develop from overgrowth of streptococcus, causing pyomyositis, and even up to necrotizing fasciitis. Thankfully, most of these superlative complications are local, but streptococcus is no stranger to becoming bloodborne and seeding in the meninges and the brain or the internal jugular vein. So, people aren't crazy to be concerned about strep throat. Our job, however, is to recognize the kernel of truth there, but weigh it up against other clinical pearls. The real issue here is, am I even concerned about streptococcal disease in this patient in front of me? Remember to go back to the basics. Sore throat has a differential diagnosis. And all we really need is our eyes and ears and what happens to be in between them to make that diagnosis. Now, let's talk about a few mimics of strep throat. Arcanobacterium hemolyticum looks a lot like and acts a lot like streptococcal disease, but it doesn't have any of the non superlative complications like rheumatic heart disease as a complication. Arcanobacterium hemolyticum often goes away on its own, but it can be treated with erythromycin. So that's a helpful one to know, a mimic with a different treatment. Group C strep and group G strep typically are foodborne pathogens, but they can present with pharyngitis plus diarrhea. Group C and G strep just need supportive care, and they don't have any of the non superlative associated complications. A more sinister mimic of strep throat is Fusobacterium necroforum. It's the famous cause of Lemire syndrome. Here you have a deep abscess that promotes anaerobic inflammation. It angers the surrounding soft tissues, and that inflammation indirectly promotes clot formation in the neighboring jugular vein. Also, Fusobacterium necroforum can get bloodborne, and it can seed that internal jugular vein, and it just loves to shoot out septic emboli everywhere. Speaking of abscesses and other deep space infections, think about peritonsillar abscess from whatever pathogen. Maybe you see a deviated uvula or unilateral tonsillar pillar swelling. That needs a needle. Think also about retropharyngeal abscess, a deep space infection of the potential prevertebral spaces found in children typically in the preschool to school age range, after which that space will obliterate unvaccinated children, and even adolescents and adults with waning immunity to Haemophilus influenzae can develop epiglottitis with pain, difficulty tolerating secretions, and even drooling. Initially, they can just come in with sore throat. 
infectious mononucleosis caused by Epstein-Barr virus is everywhere. It's estimated that up to 95% of adults are seropositive for some infection at some time in their lives. Luckily, less than 10% of those infected become symptomatic. Fever, pharyngitis, and possibly splenomegaly. Of course, the big fake out here is a sexually transmitted disease such as Neisseria gonorrhoeae, which requires another treatment and counseling altogether. Think even also of a more dangerous fake out, like acute retroviral syndrome, in which the adolescent is acutely infected with the HIV virus and then comes in with pharyngitis, fever, rash, and feeling generally terrible kind of looks a little bit like the flu. HIV testing at that stage is likely negative. As always, kick the parents out of the room if you have to for a delicate conversation. Most parents are eager for you to talk to their children and they'll happily step out when asked nicely. If they don't, just make a mental note of it. The reason may be totally innocent or very sinister. Just use your situational awareness. Now, that's all well and good, but the reality here is, after considering all of these nasty mimics, we're left with this question. Is it strep or is this a virus? If you treat them all as strep, turn to page zero. If you reserve antibiotics for those who may benefit from them, turn to page 100. Page 100. What features make the diagnosis of streptococcal disease more likely? Well, today we're not going to focus on the Centaur criteria. They're not wrong to use, and it's still the recommended method. Remember, you give a point to younger age, to exudates, cervical lymphadenopathy, fever, and the absence of cough. The problem here is it's a numerical score that gives the same weight to every feature, and the scoring is also a bit anemic. A center score of 1, and you have a 15% risk. Two to three criteria, 30% risk. Even if you have four or more criteria, you max out the tool, you still have only a 50% risk of strep. Now, risk for the disease and the sensitivity and specificity of each component are not the same. Risk includes the baseline epidemiology. However, if a tool at best is only as good as the flip of a coin, well, wouldn't you want a more sophisticated tool? Let's go through our thought process and choose our own infectious disease adventure. Okay, to give the center criteria a little bit of slack, it is true that it's problematic to speak of sensitivity and specificity when dealing with a disease that has a variable prevalence. As an example, let's say your disease is very common in your community. The sensitivity and specificity of even a terribly performing test will still be pretty good because chances are with you. The opposite is true for a low prevalence test. These are population based tests that may or may not apply to the individual in front of you. When using clinical tests, it can be even more helpful to use likelihood ratios. Likelihood ratios tell you that if this particular finding or test is positive or negative, how likely is it that this individual has or doesn't have the disease? There are positive likelihood ratios and negative likelihood ratios for the presence or absence of a particular finding or test. They're called ratios because they include sensitivity and specificity as the numerator and denominator. This means that they take both sensitivity and specificity into account, which protects us a little bit from whatever the prevalence of the disease may or may not be. You can use likelihood ratios on anyone, provided that you have some sense of how they work 
and the basics of pre- and post-test probability. A positive likelihood ratio tells us that if this test or finding or feature is positive, if it's present, what's the likelihood that the patient in front of you actually has the disease? For example, in an adult with chest pain, a positive troponin has a positive likelihood ratio of 10. That is, the fact that the troponin is abnormal gives this patient a 10 times more likelihood of actually having acute coronary syndrome as the cause of his chest pain. Is it impossible that he has something else? No, but even with someone with low to moderate pretest probability, the fact that the test is positive with that likelihood ratio, it's very, very likely that the positive test means that his chest pain is due to acute coronary syndrome. Now, a likelihood ratio is measured on a logarithmic scale. So it's like an exponential relationship. A likelihood ratio of one means that the tests being positive means that the patient is equally as likely or not to have a disease. A positive likelihood ratio is calculated by dividing the sensitivity of the test by one minus the specificity of the test. Okay, so it follows that a negative likelihood ratio means that the absence of a feature or a negative test gives the patient a likelihood of not having the disease. Again, on the logarithmic scale, a ratio of one is neutral. So if that same adult patient comes in with chest pain and has a normal troponin, what we would call a negative troponin, his negative likelihood ratio is 0 0.4. Another way to think of that is he's 60% less likely to have acute coronary syndrome based on that likelihood ratio. Now again, pre-test probability and post-test probability are important to use with likelihood ratios. If this truly is a low-risk patient and we have a negative test, that's usually pretty good, that negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.4, even though it's not perfect, will still take his low pre-test probability and cut it in half it'll give him an even lower risk than his chest pain because of that test. So we need both the test characteristics as well as your good clinical suspicion, which is a type of applied judgment and assessment. Both of them are needed in order to use likelihood ratios properly. In that same gentleman, if you were convinced that he had acute coronary syndrome, no matter what the test shows you, you're still going to be relatively worried about him. Use them both together. Negative likelihood ratios are calculated by taking 1 minus the sensitivity and dividing it by the specificity of that test. Let's take this likelihood ratio business to task with the features that you may find or not find on someone with a sore throat that may or may not have streptococcal disease. Erythema of the tonsils is so nonspecific. It'll give you a likelihood ratio, a positive likelihood ratio, of 1.07. So really, it's very neutral. That confidence interval for that finding also bridges the null of 1. So erythema of the tonsils is not so helpful to decide for sure, it's strep throat. No erythema, however, has a negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.56, making strep less likely by about half. Pharyngeal exudate? If you got it, your positive likelihood ratio is 1.85, making it about twice as likely that the patient actually has the disease, given that finding. No exudate? a likelihood ratio, negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.78. So you shave off about 20% likelihood that it is strep based on not having exudate. So you're starting to get kind of the hang of likelihood ratios now. Okay, so far these features are not big winners either way. Why do you think that is? Well, because these two features overlap with viral causes. They're not discriminative. 
So let's go for the big winners then. Palatal petechiae. This confers a stronger positive likelihood ratio of 2.7. So if you have a patient with sore throat, the fact that he has palatal petechiae makes it almost three times more likely that this is indeed strep throat. No palatal petechiae? Well, the negative likelihood ratio is only 0.9. So in this case, palatal petechiae is more of a rule in than a rule out. So you can see that using these specific positive and negative likelihood ratios, it might help you to decide, well, first of all, what is your pretest probability, your pretest assessment of whether or not this could be strep throat? You apply the appropriate likelihood ratio, and that might change your post-test probability to say, actually, I don't think this is going to end up to be strep throat, or wow, I wasn't particularly convinced, but now that I see this feature, for example, palatal petechiae, I'm going to rethink this. That might push me to making that diagnosis. Another blow to the one-size-fits-all features of the central criteria is that these are all just scores. They're just numbers. Just being under 14 has as much weight as having exudate. So by using these likelihood ratios based on your clinical assessment of the patient in front of you, you can make a more sophisticated evaluation that's tailored to your patient. Another winner is a scarlatiniform rash that has a positive likelihood ratio of four. So four times more likely that this is actually strep throat based on the fact that you find this scarlatiniform rash. If you don't have a scarlatiniform rash, the negative likelihood ratio is only 0.94. It's so close to that neutral one that it doesn't rule it out. But if you see it, it pretty much rules it in. You'll find a long list of likelihood ratios for each feature of group A strep pharyngitis in the show notes. <laughs> Let's get back to Jenny and run our own dynamic internal computer program in our brains. Jenny, say ah. Nothing. Jenny, I heard you were a great singer. I bet you can sing really high. Ah, there it is. Erythema, but no exudate. Okay, well that makes strep a little less likely. It shaves off about 20% risk. She doesn't have any cervical lymphadenopathy, so that's another 20% decrease in risk. No fever, at least yet. Okay, did I just hear her cough? All right, that halves the risk, too. Let me take a step back and just see the whole picture here. If you swab Jenny because you're unsure, go to page 396. If you base your decision on your clinical exam, go to page 14. Page 396. The swab did not go over well. Jenny is really grumpy now, and they love waiting even longer for the test. One of your students asks you, how good is the rapid test? You think, hmm, I just assumed it was a slam dunk if positive. Well, you find yourself looking that one up. The rapid antigen detection test has a 95% specificity for group A streptococcus. Its sensitivity, though, is only 70 to 90% compared to culture. So it is possible to have a false negative. According to Cohen et al. in a Cochrane review, for every 100 children with group A strep pharyngitis, 86 would be correctly confirmed with rapid testing and 14 would be missed. For this reason, the Infectious Disease Society of America recommends simultaneously swabbing for rapid strep as well as culture. If the rapid strep is negative in a child who has moderate suspicion, the second swab should be sent for culture. 
and that's all fine. But remember what we talked about in terms of pretest probability? Well, it's important here. So many people are colonized by group A strep, and often it never causes symptoms. The traditional number for the carrier rate is 25%, which that alone should really give us some pause. But in a recent meta-analysis among children, Shake et al. in pediatrics found that the carrier state could be up to 37%. This is why it's important to be selective about whom we swab. Let's do a little thought experiment. If most children who have pharyngitis have a viral etiology, we know this to be true, and more than a third who come to your department will have a positive test regardless of their symptoms, you can see that many are at risk for having something that is true, true, and unrelated. True that they have a positive antigen swab. True that they have pharyngitis. But if we use a very liberal approach to swabbing, a large number will be viral with an incidental positive swab. The problem here, of course, is that we can give more power to the test than to our own clinical skills. Now, this is especially troublesome if you already believe that this is viral because the kid looks, well, viral. Runny nose, he's able to take fluids, he barely has an exudate, he has cough. You swab because of the pressure. But if the test is positive, is it really strep anyway? Page 14. You base your diagnosis on the history and physical exam. If you can make the diagnosis of a viral pharyngitis, there's erythema, some trace exudate, a cough, a runny nose, the child is well appearing, then great. Off they go without the potential harms of bacterial resistance, diarrhea, upset stomach, or drug reaction because of the antibiotic that we just gave them. If you can make the diagnosis of strep throat by exam, a hot potato voice, erythema, adherent exudate, cervical lymphadenopathy, fever, then will a negative test really deter your treatment? The rapid antigen test is for people that you're on the fence about. If you would believe the test either way, that is, the child has moderate suspicion, then test away. I'll tell you my approach in a moment. What's the big deal about antibiotics? Well, in adults, in developed countries, it's been purported that the number needed to treat to prevent one case of rheumatic heart disease, and really the only thing that's potentially preventable, it's somewhere in the thousands. As we mentioned before, in children, we just don't know. And it is possible that the reason we do so well in developed countries is because we treat our children who have strep throat with antibiotics. Remember, the non-superative complications of strep throat include rheumatic heart disease, which we really don't understand completely, but it may have to do with our innate immune system taking the group A strep antigen and presenting it to T cells which cause an immunologic cascade, antibody production, and there's a cross-reaction with the immune response. The group A strep antigen is a molecular mimic to your fine heart valves. So, they get attacked. They sclerose, they stop functioning, and then you have heart failure decades later. If we treat the infection early, then we decrease the time that the bacterial antigen can provoke the innate immune system's overreaction. Again, this is difficult to prove or disprove. The other big non-superative reaction is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. It usually happens about one to two weeks after strep throat, presenting with edema, hypertension, and nephritis. 
No one can prevent this one, and you'll get glomerulonephritis or you won't. This is where good return precautions are helpful in anyone who you think has strep throat. Really, in developed countries, we also want to try to prevent acute rheumatic fever. It's a non-supportive complication as well, happening about one to two weeks after the group A strep infection. Carditis occurs in up to 65% of patients, and anything from the pericardium to the epicardium, the myocardium, the valves, all of that can be affected. Listen for a new murmur or a rub or an effusion without evidence of congestive heart failure. Polyarthritis is also very common. Sindenham's chorea is only seen in about 10% of patients. Patients may have muscle weakness, emotional instability, or those involuntary jerking movements. Erythema marginatum and subcutaneous nodules are not as common. They occur in about 10% of cases. Now, all of those that we just mentioned are the major criteria. The minor criteria include fever, polyarthralgia, elevated acute phase reactants, and a prolonged PR interval. Acute rheumatic fever is treated very similarly to an acute group A strep infection with antibiotics to decolonize, anti-inflammatories, and supportive care. Okay, so let's treat this thing. The vast majority of patients can go home, and you have two options for the outpatient regimen. P.O. or I.M. Now, before you call me Dr. McMeany Pants, there is a practical reason for an intramuscular injection. Imagine forcing penicillin syrup into a young child three times a day for 10 days. I.M. means one bad day and it's over. There's 100% compliance. So my usual spiel for the preschool to young school age child who can't take pills and who can't spell quickly is, okay, mom, it looks like we'll need to give an antibiotic. I could give you something for 10 days or we can do a quick SHOT right now and that's it. Either way is okay with me. What do you think? Often I get an audible sigh of relief from mom and we go for the SHOT. It turns out that IM penicillin has been studied more for the prevention of acute rheumatic fever and is more likely to eradicate group A strep from the oral pharynx compared to PO regimens. You know, that reminds me, I think we could do a quick review of the penicillins. Penicillin V is the oral form that we can use in adolescents and adults to treat group A strep infections. Typically, we give 500 milligrams BID or TID for 10 days. All right, now let's get into the IV and IM stuff. Penicillin G can be given as an immediate acting intravenous or short acting intramuscular agent. You'll see this for treatment of endocarditis or neurosyphilis. Penicillin G procaine is a variant of penicillin G, and it can only be used IM. It's also short-acting. To treat serious group A strep infections, we need a combination of short and long-acting drugs. Kind of like when you do an intraarticular injection to reduce a joint, you would like a mixture of a little lidocaine to act immediately, and maybe a little bupivacaine to have more lasting effect to aid in the analgesia. For this reason, we will often give a mixture of penicillin G benzathine, which is long acting, and penicillin G procaine, as we mentioned, short acting. You'll get quick blood levels to try to prevent acute rheumatic fever, along with a long-acting dose to treat the child over the next several days. This can be under the brand name Bicillin CR for continuous release. You'll give 1.2 million units for children less than 27 kilos, and you'll double it to 2.4 million units for those 27 kilos and above. Basically, when you're 8 years old, you get the double dose. For adults, 
the IDSA recommends just penicillin G benzathine, the long-acting one, presumably because acute rheumatic fever is not as much of a concern. Anyway, I'm blurting all of this stuff out at you seemingly randomly, not because I expect us all to remember this off the top of our heads, but I mention it because it is so easy, especially with our electronic medical record, to accidentally order the IV solution IM or vice versa. Just realize that our pharmacist is not here to harass us. It really does make a difference which penicillin we use. The PO regimen alternative is amoxicillin, 25 milligrams per kilogram, BID for 10 days. One last question I wanted to address is something that comes up relatively often. Should we give a steroid to decrease the inflammation? There's ample evidence in adults that a one-time dose of dexamethasone can decrease symptomatology in viral and bacterial pharyngitis in adults. There's some weaker evidence for children, but the best practice is to reserve dexamethasone for rapid antigen-positive group A strep pharyngitis. And the reason is this. Very, very rarely, leukemia can present as tonsillar hypertrophy and inflammation. If we just throw steroids at any sore throat, we may delay the diagnosis of leukemia because one of its first-line therapies is a steroid. We can douse the malignant fire but not put it out. Hence, the documented bacterial infection. In practice, however, I almost never have to give a child a steroid for any pharyngitis because they do so well with our standard supportive care. Adults seem to suffer a lot, so I give it to any adult who has significant pain in swallowing. They really won't benefit so much from the antibiotic, but I've had patients stop me in the grocery store and tell me how much the steroid really helped them. So in children, a steroid for pharyngitis has a low-yield benefit, and it also has its caveats. In adults, go for it. Okay, I promised you I would tell you my approach, but... First, a caveat. If you're unsure about how to proceed, there is nothing wrong with following guidelines. However, the guidelines just give us a baseline, somewhere to start from, something we can all refer to and we tailor to the individual patient. Since the Centaur criteria, in my opinion, perform so weakly, and by the way, to be completely transparent and honest, we may never develop a perfect tool that prevents us from treating carriers or stops us from treating those who actually have the disease. So what's my approach? Well, first, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, I call that duck viral pharyngitis and move on. If the child or adult has a fever and exudate and all of the symptoms that seem to localize just to the oral pharynx, not a lot of systemic symptoms, especially if they talk like this. I make sure that I don't see a peritonsillar abscess already, and I call it strep, and I treat it with antibiotics if it's a child and steroids if it's an adult. I can count on one hand how many times I've used the rapid strep to make my decision, because with a good history and physical, Using all of those sophisticated likelihood ratios and individual features, tailoring it to the patient in front of me really helps me to make that decision. And it's often enough to sway me one way or the other. In summary, the whole is more than just the sum of its parts. Use all pieces of information at your disposal. How likely is it that this is strep? If you're convinced that it's viral, then there's no use in trying to confirm something that you wouldn't believe. 
If it's strep, good for you for making the diagnosis. If you need to test, just be careful about the caveats and the pitfalls. Primum non nocere. First, do no harm. That includes how we interact, what we examine, how we examine, how or whether we test, and what we do to treat. In the end, we are just humble servants of our patients and of our art. We can be mistaken very easily. Show your logic to your patients and invite them to come back if they're worse. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.